two blind painters, in which is shown that sensory inputs and pathways are not necessary for consciousness. Seeing is but a combination of old memories, a private dream led by a tyrannical dictator shouting his shifting orders from the outside, this Galileo thought entering the next room. For in that room too was a vast canvas showing a cabinet of curiosities. A man stood near the canvas, moving his hand over its surface with unnatural slowness. Was this the circle of sick painters? And how was the lady seated nearby, holding her hand on the heart? You see, said the man, this painting is so wonderfully rich, it took me almost two hours to go over it again. The woman watching a painting within the painting must be the sense of sight personified, and the art chamber as a whole signifies visual perception. It is an allegory of vision, you see. It means that light leaves the eye and shines over the objects that surround us, so we can see them. At least, this is what I once used to think, said the man, taking his hand off the canvas. Unless the eye is like the sun, it cannot see the sun, but I was wrong. The eye is just a door through which its rays enter our mind. Vision is in the mind, not in the eye. Galileo remembered what Kepler used to say. Vision occurs through a picture painted on the dark surface of the retina. The eye is like a camera obscura, where the image is reversed, and Kepler used to tease his audience to explain why we do not see the world upside down. Not that he knew the answer. But if vision is in the mind, thought Galileo, it does not matter that the image in the retina is reversed. Indeed, intervened Frick. The retina has little to do with conscious vision. At its center, where the optic nerve takes its leave, it is not even sensitive to light, yet we do not see a hole in the middle of each sight. And, though the outer parts of the retina are blind to color, we do not see a gray sky envelop the gold of the sun. And finally, the retina flickers all the time, because our eyes move imperceptibly, but the image seen by consciousness, those do not flicker at all. They are stable and majestic. Galileo saw that the man was still going over the canvas with his hand, inspecting it in every detail. You too are a painter? he asked. At your service, answered the man. Compa Savaragna was once my name. You may or may not have heard my story. You see, stranger, said the man. One of my brothers of the academy, we met secretly under the auspices of Bacchus, made an elixir for me. He distilled boxwood and brewed the mushrooms of the Val di Blenio. What else he did with it, I do not know which tasted sweet and did enhance my powers. So when I drank of it, my mind expanded, my art as well. Colors became more vivid, shapes more real, faces took on a life of flesh, and limbs walked off the canvas to greet me and cry about their fate. So I began to imagine my masterpiece, the fall of the rebel angels, and in the imagination I could hold it, as real as if it were before my eyes, and contemplate each brush stroke, refine here, enliven there, playing with each corner of my creation. Every morning when I was lying in bed, my mind stared by the potion. I worked without relent on my great rebel fall, and saw it grow to excel all I had seen before. The colors of Titian and the shapes of Michelangelo the passion of Montaigne and the genius of Leonardo, all fused within a single canvas. The lips I painted screamed, the eyes turned to implore for mercy. The painting was so alive it drew me inside and almost scorched my soul. Until I talked to the creator, I had myself created, deshaping and dissenting of the highest art. I'm not sure I know your work, said Galileo. Where does the fall of the rebel angels hang? Stranger, said the man, covering his eyes. I see you do not understand, or act as if you don't. Because the morning the fall was finished in my mind, and I woke up to paint it, so sharply that every detail was etched within my consciousness, that all I had to do was put it down on canvas. 
the morning when I was to be crowned the greatest, having exceeded all and every one. That morning, when I opened my eyes, I saw my room was dark, and thence my day grew darker. The poison in the drink had taken its revenge, the painting was still burning in my head, but it was locked inside, an unseen prisoner within my mind. That day, I did not paint any further. Was your masterpiece lost forever and for all? asked Galileo. Or can you still behold it in your mind? There is no greater sorrow than to remember happy times in misery, said the painter. It lingers in the imagination, but it is not what it was. A whole life has now been drained away from it. Then tell me, if you please, said Galileo, the canvas you were touching, the allegory of vision, can you close your eyes and see in your mind the woman watching the painting in the painting? Of course I can, stranger. I have touched her more than once, and my friends filled in by telling me what I had missed. And did they tell you what color drapes are? Certainly. It is a turquoise shawl. Can you see that color vividly in your mind? Of course I can see a bright turquoise shawl in my mind. You know a painter must be good at imagining how things look, he answered. Otherwise we would have to try out all colors in the canvas instead of choosing them beforehand. And when you sleep? And dream of flames, can you see their color? asked Galileo. Naturally, said the blind man. Many of my paintings have come to me in a dream. Don't you understand that form embodies all that may be occasioned in the imagination and can be seen through the eye? Casting his eyes upward, he added in a piercing voice, I wanted to rival the draftsmanship of the prince of painters, equal the inventions of the great druid. But when I reached the age of our Lord died on the cross, fate crucified me to a blind sepulchre. Now both my eyes are rotten through the poison, as good as lost. So I ended up a man who paints, but only in the imagination. A blink, and color fades from all my works. I ended up a man who strives, but never can create. A man who writes a treatise on begetting children, but can have none himself. Oi cecichelloc nol velcom gale nol cante. The blind painter fell silent, his head turned down. But the old lady, who had not yet moved, now touched him gently on the forearm and spoke. I feel your anguish in my heart, my boy. I do. For me too it's difficult to paint. They always ask me, but I am too tired. You know, don't you? that I am almost a hundred. The man recoiled. Do not remind me, foolish lady. Your eyes should have been closed by death long before mine were covered by darkness. He raised his head toward Galileo. To think that in her day she was the envy of Europe. Her works were prized by all the masters. But now, like me, her sight is paralyzed and she lives at the mercy of others, a burden to herself. Why do you like to claim that I am blind, my boy? replied the old lady with a smile. Maybe it makes you feel better, though I do not understand. I still can take good care of my appearance, and now how I should turn my head so that my wrinkles... What are you saying, old Sophonispa? What would this young man care about wrinkles, of all things? You and your wrinkles, said the blind painter. If truly you can see, why must the maid lead you everywhere? Why can't you recognize your visitors until they speak? My boy, she answered. An old lady is uncertain in her steps. She must think twice before she risks an answer. And in my house it's dark. They keep the curtains shut most of the time. A lady, always the same excuses, said the blind painter, always denying you are blind, and yet you cannot see anything at all. Indeed, as far as I can see, you are evidently much blinder than I am, for, he went on, 
At least I know what blindness is. Blindness has been my mistress for far too many years. But from my mistress I have learned much. From her cruel whim I learned that I still can see. I can see spaces fly it in front of me. The shapes of men and beasts, things blue and red, pale and bright, as fully as if they were painted by Titian. And I still dream of paintings. I see them in my sleep. If I could not see them, how could I write my treatises? But you, you do not even know what it is like to be blind because you do not know what it is like to see. And with your art, ah, there you are fully lost. You couldn't even tell what perspective is or means. Oh, yes, I can, my boy, replied the old lady. Perspective is that habit of the mind by which the people who are close to you are larger and more important than those who are distant relatives or those who are total strangers, who are indeed very small. It's beyond help, said the blind painter, looking at Galileo. Let me try her again. Lady, can you tell me what is painted inside the frame that's on the table? That's one, the left, of the great canvas I am touching. It's a strange object. Most of my friends at first don't notice, but just by touching its peculiar texture, I can tell what it is, even without the benefit of my eyes. Sure, said the old lady. Nothing could be easier. Let me see now. What could it be? Well, in a nutshell, in fact, it could be anything. Is it a silvery spider web? I'm not sure. But it may contain a lot of other things, perhaps all of them. How is it pounded? You see, exclaimed the blind painter, aiming at Galileo. She has no idea. Lady, can you name any of the objects on the canvas? Well, young man, that could be difficult indeed, as it is kind of empty around here. Empty, said the blind painter. It's as crowded as a marketplace in Naples. How can you say it's kind of empty? Of course, my boy, said the old lady. That's not what I meant. Of course, it is all crowded. If you only knew how much it cost me to furnish the room with those expensive things. Can you believe it, stranger? said the blind painter. She is blind like a mole and does not know it. She does not know what she is talking. She does not even know we are describing a painting and thinks we are wasting words about her room. I beg you, young man, don't be rude, said the old lady. You see, young man, it stands to reason. If this is my room, I spent so much to furnish it with all sorts of precious things. Then it stands to reason there should be paintings too. Something's terribly wrong with you, lady, said the blind painter. Sight is the great queen of the senses, her realm the greatest in the mind, her possessions more varied and more extended than those of other monarchs. But her kingdom is in the mind, not in the eye, and this great queen seems to have left your mind an orphan. Frick had been listening quietly the whole time. Now he neared Galileo and whispered in his ear. The blind painter is exactly right, Frick said. He merely lost his eyes, but can still see within his brain. The old lady instead has cortical blindness. She lost the portions of her corticothalamic system that contribute seeing to consciousness. Her blindness is a blindness of the soul, not of the eye. Her eyes may be all right, but she does not know anymore what seeing means. Just like you would not know what bees might think of flowers, asked the old lady absent-mindedly. Just so, dear lady, answered Galileo. The eye, the retina, are mere triggers, though they are triggers with a million teeth. 
When we are awake and our eyes are open, they tell the mind what it ought to see. They look outside and then select, out of the varied collection in consciousness's grand gallery, which painting should be shown with light, but they don't do the seeing, no, that's something for the mind alone. For even though the eyes may be shut, as when asleep, or injured, as with a blind painter, the mind still sees, and of its own accord decides what's to be seen. If the images of consciousness are created in the cerebrum, not in the retina, thought Galileo, then of course the lady's eyes could be alive and blind, but the blind man could see. Notes This dialogue between two blind painters, one retinal and one cortical, is based on Juan Paolo Lamozzo and Sofonispa Anguissola. Lamozzo became blind early on, though not necessarily due to methanol poisoning, and turned into a prominent art theoretician. He was a member of the unconventional academy of the Val di Blenio, dedicated to Bacchus, and used a half-invented dialect to compose grotesque poems. His attributed self-portrait as abbot of the Val di Blenio is at the Pinacoteccia di Brera, Milan. Lamozzo visited Sofonispa, who became blind at the age of 96, although her blindness was probably of the eye and not of the cortex, as pretended here. What Frick tells Galileo about the retina and its lack of contribution to vision is quite accurate. Francis Crick and Christoph Koch make the point very clear in several publications, especially in Koch's The Quest for Consciousness, Roberts 2004. Complete cortical blindness, notably Anton's syndrome, from the German neurologist who described it as a blindness of the soul or a Seelenblindheit, is a rare condition resulting from bilateral occipital damage. A similar condition was described by Seneca in his letter to Lucilius, Book 5, Letter 9. You know that Harpest, this, my wife's fatuous companion, has remained in my home as an inherited burden. This foolish woman has suddenly lost her sight, incredibly as it may appear. What I am going to tell you is true. She does not know she is blind. Therefore, again and again, she asks her guardian to take her elsewhere. She claims that my home is dark. Like Sophonispa in this chapter, Arpestes and Anton's patient are blind but in either condition. They may fall over objects, try to walk through a wall or through a closed door, do not recognize relatives and instead describe people and objects that are not there at all. These patients indeed have lost the knowledge of what seeing means, but they have a vast store of verbal memories with which they confabulate about visual things they cannot even imagine. Such an awareness of deficit, also known as anasognosia, is not unusual with certain cortical lesions. Other patients may deny that their limbs are paralyzed. Another form of anasognosia is often found in hemineglect, usually due to lesions in right parietal cortex, in which patients ignore the left side of the world. For example, a painter with hemineglect described briefly in chapter 11 might paint his self-portrait with only the right half of the face showing, not to mention dress only his right side, eat from the right side of the plate only and imagine the right side of things only. For a hemineglect patient it makes no sense at all to talk about the left side of the world. It simply does not exist, just as for all of us it makes no sense to talk about what the world would look like if we had the brain of a bee.